Hello everyone, you join us once again at the Hat and Tub, it's me Jack and Dave. Hello. And today, you might have seen just this morning we pour out a new video all about the difference between analog control and digital control yes. and answering a few of the big myths and questions that people tend to have about both control systems and seeing which might be best for your layout. So. We're going to answer any questions you might have today. So I am once again manning the chat over here. All you need to do is pop a question in the chat and we'll try our best to get Certainly. to you. Certainly. We'll be here about 45 minutes with any of the big questions you've got regarding digital or analog. And it is a big question in itself, really. It's it one really of the is. most important aspects of any model railway layout as to which way you go with your control. How do you get your locomotives to move? And there's some really big questions that we always get asked, and it's a lot of things that people just aren't quite so sure on. So we've got a lot of equipment in front of us today. As you can see, we've pretty much filled the table with different <laughs> controllers and equipment and locomotives to see just what's possible, whether you want to go analog or whether you want to go digital. That's it. So we'll go through a few of the basics, show you off some of the equipment that you can use, uh, go through some of the decoders that are available, and Dave's got his, his trusty tools I have and indeed. all his bits and bobs over over here and we'll give you a close look at how decoders come into the locomotives and stuff like that. Right, um, got a few people joining us already. Hello, Hi good there. to see you guys. Jackmas Prime 50, hello. We will be talking about Hornby Controls today, got a few here to talk about. Yeah. Um, SLD51, hello again, thanks for joining us. Uh, Magma Animations and Gameplay also says hello. So hi everyone, thanks for joining us. And um, any thanks questions, there, guys. any questions at all, pop them in the chat and we will get to them. One of the main questions I saw coming up this morning when we put it out on our Facebook channel is just what is the difference between analog and digital? What, what advantages does one offer? Which way is it best to go? And really the answer to that question is it can depend on exactly how your layout is set up and what you want from a controller, how you want to operate your layout. And just to cover some of the real basics of how it all works, your analog system is a controller such as the Gage Master Combi. We do have others from Hornby, who we mentioned before, and a few other suppliers. Now, this is a way of getting electricity into your layout. All the locos run on electricity to start off with, and this controls just how much electricity is being put through the track. So you'll have a plug that comes into this, two wires that come out of the top into the track, and then any locomotive on that piece of track where you've got the wires going into will move. It's as simple as that. It really is a really simple way to get up and running, isn't it? All you really need to do is plug it all together and play. That's quite exactly a it. Quite a simple system, and it's really good if you're just running one loco at a time or if you want to isolate sections up. We do go into a lot more detail in our video that we posted this morning, so do check our channel below, and you can see that yes. video, which goes into a lot more detail on stuff like that. And you can go a lot further down there as well if you've got multiple tracks and you want to operate a side, set of sidings or you want to operate a main line. We do do larger analog controllers as well, such as the HM2000. It is a beast, that thing. It isn't is it? a bit of a beast. It's got a bit <laughs> of weight to it as well, actually. And the good bonus about this is it also has sockets on the back for additional outputs. So you don't only have to control your control system for this, should I say, your actual layout in your locomotives. You can also control accessories such as lights and signals and points through that as well. You can have an extra electrical output to make those come on on your layout too. So it just adds that flexibility to the operation, just makes that fully come through there. And again, it's, it's as we've said before in quite a few of our videos, there really is an option for everyone here. That's it. it's, it's whatever level you want to operate your layout. If you've got a smaller single track layout and you want to go analog, maybe something like the Combi or the Hornby controllers for you with just a single dial. But then heading into the large controllers, if you've got a bigger setup, you can start looking at things like the HM2000. And the power output there will handle quite of pretty much everything you can throw at it in those sizes as well, really. The amount coming through the Combi will be able to handle one or two smaller locos on a layout. And you can get more than one locomotive on an analog layout too. You can get a setup on there, what Jack mentioned before briefly was isolating tracks, so you'll have switches on your layout as to where certain locomotives are, and that part of your layout won't have the electrical connection going through it until you flick the switch. So you do have a level of control there where you can 
switch out different locomotives, parts of your layout, and operate multiple items just on the one controller. That's it. And another thing to consider is there's really is controllers out there to suit all budgets. So yes. if you don't really want to be spending too much, you can get some for under £20. I believe this one's available for £14.50. I think or that's the price. They're yeah. about, isn't it? And it means that you can really get set up straight away. And obviously, if... Yeah, uh, if you, another way to get started is to buy a, a starter set as well, which quite often do it come yes. bundled with one of these controls for free. So there, there is a lot of methods to get started. They're a really simple thing to get started with, and all it is is the two wires from the controller into your track, and you've instantly got a model railway to get started with. And that's the advantage of analog, as you say. It's simple, it's easy, it's really good to just get started with. That's it. Let's see if we've got any questions. I got right, it. SLD51 straight in here with the first question of the day, and oh. he says... What happens if you plug multiple analog controls onto the same track? Will the loco blow up? It won't as far as I'm aware. I don't think you're going to see any big explosions or anything like that, but we strongly recommend against it, really. With the, with the systems all being interconnected, we really don't recommend putting more than one in at the same time. If you do want a little bit more power in your layout, your best thing to do is go for one of the larger controllers. Yeah, I think just that's... To, just to make sure that's there. So wouldn't really recommend that. That's a do not try this at home sort of, <laughs> sort of tag on that one, really. Do, do stick with one controller. Something we'll let Sam's trains try in one of his experiments, yes. I think. But yeah, uh, yeah ne definitely do not try that at home. Right, so we've talked a little bit about analog already, so should we talk a bit more about digital? Now, digital we do get a lot of questions about because although there's quite a lot written out there, the, the basics themselves aren't really covered too well. You can go really down into the, for want of a better term, the nitty gritty into digital. And a, but, a lot of people do get quite daunted by it starting up, don't they? They think it, it's very complicated. On the absolute basic level, it's completely nothing to get daunted by. It's just as easy to get started as it is in analog. So if you're heading over to digital, the main difference is, is this is a bit more computerized, so to speak. So you've still got your controller, you've still got your plug coming into that, and you've still got your two wires to the track. At the moment, we're still the exact same as analog. Pretty much. But this is where it gets different. Now, all of your layout can be live at once. So where you've got the electrical connection coming through from the controller on an analog system, if you wanted to turn different locomotives on and off, you'd have to have an isolating section on your track with a little switch. So how does it do that in digital? How is it that everything's live but only one locomotive will go when you select it? Now, decoders. I don't know why I'm asking <laughs> you the question because I know the answer. So the main thing is, as Jack just said, each locomotive has its own little computer chip inside it, Should which we give is a called a decoder. Up on one of those? We can indeed. So I will get one out of the packet there. If you give me a one moment, I will get that ready for you. And these all come to fit in a digital locomotive. This is a 21 pin decoder, and I'll come back to the different sorts of pins later. But this is a tiny little computer trip which has a unique number on it for each locomotive. So you can assign a locomotive any number you want between 1 and 9,999. So you've got a couple to choose from there, a couple of different, couple of different levels. You're not usually going to run out of options really on a digital controller. And what happens then is you send a signal from your digital controller through the track, but only targeting a certain locomotive. So you can, for example, say locomotive number five, I want you to move forwards. And you'll control it in broadly the same way, using a dial there to control the amount of power going through. But the difference is every single locomotive on your layout will hear that instruction, but only locomotive number five in this example will actually recognize it and act on it. Right. So you are telling certain engines what to do. So you don't need to worry about having those isolating sections and it does mean you can drive multiple locomotives on the same piece of track because you're only giving the instruction to the locomotive you want to. But at the same time, you do need to start putting the decoders in the locomotives and it's a little bit of an additional task there. Now, they do come in at sort of 10, 15 pounds upwards. So it's not that expensive to get started on digital. And a lot of locos come pre-digital fitted now as well. Yeah. But also, we do offer a fitting service as well. So if you're not quite too confident on fitting locomotives up, we do offer that as a service. But just to give you a couple of examples, we have actually opened up some of the locomotives. We've been touching on this in some of our live streams so far, opening up the locos and showing you where the digital socket is. And we've got a couple of other examples here. We can give you some close-ups. 
just to show you the different types of connections and the different ways that they go in. So this is a six pin socket and this is in our Andrew Barkley locomotive. Now, what you see here is not actually the chip. This is what's called a blanking plate. And this completes the circuit, the electrical circuit, if you're using the locomotive on analog. So out of the box with this little blanking plate in, this locomotive will be absolutely fine on analog. But one question we were asked before as well is, can you run an analog locomotive without a digital chip on a digital layout? And we would strongly recommend against that, to be honest with you, because of the, the type of electricity going through, etc. It can burn out some of the motor parts, yeah. etc. So if you are running a loco on a digital layout, sorry, if you're running a loco on a, yes, if you're running an analog loco on a digital layout, we don't recommend that. But you can go the other way. If you've got a loco that's digital fitted, you can run that on an analog layout yeah. without any issues. Well, so, quite often we see people, even if they just want to try out, if they might have a digital sound fitted loco, if they just want to try out the sound, sometimes if you put that on an analog layer, it will play the sounds, won't it? That's absolutely right. Sorry, let's go back to the, the chassis there. Now, this is an N-gauge locomotive, and this has an 18-pin decoder socket. Now, there's four main types. We've looked at the 6-pin with the Barclay. This is the 18-pin. Now, again, we have a blanking plate there and a decoder socket. So all it is to fit your own decoder, if you're buying a locomotive that's called DCC ready, you open the locomotive, remove the blanking plate, fit in your choice of decoder, put it on your layout and away you go. A lot of DCC installations now are really easy to carry out along that way. So coming on from the 18 pin, we have one that will be familiar to quite a few people watching, which is the eight pin connector. Now this again just has a little blanking plate in there and holes for the eight pins and your decoder sits straight into that spot and away you go on digital. And last but not least, the last of the major types. There are a few more than these but you don't really see them covered in the UK model railway scene. Now this is a 21 pin decoder and again you've got that blanking plate there which removes and slots back into place for you to put a decoder in. So it really does cover the terminology of plug and play here, where you just have to open the body up of the locomotive, put your decoder in after removing the blanking plate, and you're good to go on a digital layout. That's it. You sort of touched on before that, obviously, with digital, you do have to put the extra effort in of fitting up all your locomotives. Yes. But in a sense, you could almost see it as a trade-off against analogue where um, you don't have to do the work in setting up all those isolating sections that we talked about before with digital. All you have to do is ensure that all the track is wired up and you can operate anything due to the fact that you are communicating with the locomotive rather than just pouring power through the track itself. Absolutely. So that's what um, we've been trying to get at um, quite a bit in the, in the video earlier today and here in this live stream is that there isn't really a bad control system there or isn't. there is one there isn't. isn't better than the other they're just t totally different and it depends on what your skill sets are and what you're comfortable with doing and what you're most uh, fancy and well how you most fancy operating your layout absolutely and the main thing to bear in mind as well is if you're not quite sure of which way to go you've got us here now to ask some questions and we can help you out but even after the live stream give us a call send us an email, send a message through Facebook, pop into our store. We have all the controllers available. We've got guys and girls who are trained up on this so we can really help you make the right decision on what controller you need. That's it. Seven days a week, we are happy to help. We are indeed. <laughs> How are we doing on the questions? We've got a couple here. So uh, quite a lot of people are saying hello. Some familiar names who we've had over the last few live streams. Ah, okay. We're Hi, getting, Marius. getting regulars now, are we? That's it. We've got Marius <laughs> Music here again. Oh, hello. No. Hello guys, Pareto12, he says this is a great topic and thanks for making this live, thanks for watching. Thanks uh, for coming with us and as said, if you have any questions regarding the basics of analog or digital control systems, let us know. Yeah, we've got Common Road Junction says, what's the cheapest uh, digital control that you recommend? Now, cheap digital controllers start off at examples like the Hornby Select. We do have a number of cheaper end digital controllers and this starts off at about 70 or 80 pounds for a select now but it can go up from there so again have a look through the range one we do offer is the NCE power cab which is a little bit more advanced 
but it is still a good starter controller as well and they come in at about 150 pounds at the moment but you are looking at spending something sort of about 70 80 upwards but as jack said before we do offer digital starter sets as well as analog starter sets which include a locomotive track and a controller to get you going so if you just fancy an out of the box trial of a new system or want to give one a go that's one of the best ways to do it. Well, especially if you're just starting your first layout, it quite often can work out more cost effective to buy a train set with a controller included because quite often they can be available for a special price or a cheap uh, package cost where if you were to buy all those things separately, it would cost a little bit more. So if you are after track and some stock as well, it's a really good way to go. But uh, as Dave said, if you're after a controller to get started, we, we can really recommend the Select. And there are quite a few more available on our website. So if you, if you head over to tatansocket.uk, you can check out everything we've got to offer. Yes. Now, one question I saw pop up in the chat just then as well, and it came up on our Facebook questions before, is some of the terminology regarding digital is a little confusing as yeah. well sometimes. And it's a question we do get asked by a lot of people. So don't worry if it's on your mind you have a lot of kindred spirits. Now, this is the question of some of the packaging sometimes on locomotives. So you'll see descriptions such as DCC ready, DCC on board, DCC compatible, and they all sound pretty similar and it, you can get quite confused as to what they mean. Absolutely. So to give you a bit of a brief guide, DCC ready will mean that the locomotive has space for a digital decoder already. So it will have, such as the Andrew Barclay we saw before, a socket for the decoder ready to plug and play. All you need to do is take out that blanking plate and put the decoder in. So that is a locomotive that's DCC ready, ready for digital. Then DCC compatible is something that needs a little bit more work. That means that it's capable of having the wires for a decoder soldered onto it. So if you're quite handy with a soldering iron, that's the one for you. It won't have the full connections ready for just a plug and play decoder, but you can still make it work on a digital layout. And that locomotive as well will still work on an analog layout yeah. with that digital decoder fitted. And then finally, last but not least, DCC on board is the easy one. It's already got a digital decoder in there, so you can use it straight away on an analog or digital layout. One other option to consider is DCC sound fitted locos. Yes. So that means that you've got already got a sound speaker fitted and a decoder. So if you want the absolute top end full suite of options on digital, that's the way to go because you've already got your speaker and your decoder all on board. And it doesn't mean that later on, uh, I think we discussed this in the 121 live stream where you showed off the sound speaker enclosure in there. Yes. You, you, it is something that you can do yourself in the future, but it is a lot easier to have all that stuff pre-fitted. Now, some locomotives um, quite recently have started to come with speakers built in, yes. but might not be DCC fitted. So the speaker is there sitting and waiting even in the analog version of the locomotive. And all you need to do is hook it up at a later date. So, so look out for locomotives that do have that feature because it is quite a nice one. But digital sound is not just for digital users. A lot of digital sound locomotives now will work on an analog layout too. So analog controllers will not miss out on a digital sound locomotive. You won't be able to play through all the sound functions and it is only certain locomotives that do it. So just check before you buy one but you can still get the full sort of sound experience on an analog layout with some locomotives. There is other great entry level ways to get into sound as well. Um, Hornby offers quite a range of their TTS or twin track sound decoders now. Yes. Some locomotives do come pre-fitted with that system and it really is great for the price. Some of the sounds are fantastic yes. and the equipment that comes with it too is really good for the price. Um, so there is really a lot of options out there if you were looking to get into there sound too. Is. Should we have a look at the chat we again, see indeed. what everyone's saying? We shall indeed. So Marius is back again with another question and he says, this is a little bit off topic, but he says, what's your favorite LNER tender engine? We were talking about Ooh. tender engines in the last live stream, weren't we? We weren't sure what to uh, mm. pick. I think it'll have to be the Flying Scotsman for me. It's, it's a classic. It's, it's got it? to be the most famous, famous there as well. And with, with our old gauge model on the way, I keep looking at it, the development model we've got at the moment, keep thinking, oh, that's, it's that's absolutely beautiful, that's isn't it? That's the one. I mean, you're, you're loving the old gauge stuff at the moment, aren't you? I so. am, I am at the moment, so. <laughs> I think I'm gonna cheat and I'm just gonna say the A4. <laughs> well, yeah, fair enough. It's out there, isn't it? 
Um, SLD51 says, which do we prefer, the HST or the Class 800? Now, that's a controversial question right there. Ooh, I think I'm going to have to go for my stock answer of both. Uh, okay. <laughs> and again, completely different designs, completely different duties. Okay, the, uh, the 800 to replacing the HSTs. And some people find that a bit controversial, but at the same time, it is a sleek 21st century design and it's upholding the prestige of the HST, Yeah, really. So they've both got their place. The, the HST's made a lot of history. The Class 800's about to make a lot of history. So of quite a few years down the line, I think we'll be looking at them in exactly the same way as Well, they're, they're both iconic essentially designs. products of the time, aren't they? The HST Certainly. was in its heyday and still is now, I'd say, yes. um, an incredibly capable express locomotive and a set. And the 800, might be different and modern, but it's doing the same sort of job. So yeah. it, they both were quite useful and quite important uh, engines there. So who else have we got on? Dennis Nowles, hello. He says, hi, loving the videos. What type of turnout are used for DCC, dead or live frogs? That's a good question to cover. Actually. It is a good question. Now you can use both types with a little bit of work on them. It depends just how much you prepare to do some chopping and changing underneath to get them going. You'll always find, to be honest, really, it's more dependent on the type of locomotives you want to run because a dead frog will give you that little bit more plastic in there on the actual frog itself. So you have to bear in mind that with smaller wheelbase locomotives such as the Andrew Barclay, or the Andrew Barclay chassis as I hold it up, <laughs> you'll find that you're probably better off going live frog on it However, a lot of operators, a lot of providers now, should I say, are bringing in what's called a unifrog system, yeah. which brings in the best of both, which has a smaller part of plastic and a larger part of metal there, so you keep the connection down right to the last moment. But as to using them on analog or digital, there's a little bit of work involved on getting them set up for both, and to be honest, it kind of balances out about the same amount of work. So I would recommend going for what's called a unifrog where you can, but otherwise, have a look at what the locos are in your setup. If you've got locos with small wheelbases, that's you know that's really going to be the one that's the clincher of the question. And we do offer you know advice on how to wire them up for analog or digital as well. Whether you're going what's called electrofrog or the insul frog, which is the dead frog we mentioned, or the unifrog, and we can give you advice on how to wire them up for an analog or digital layout. So it's really down to you the question there and more based on what locomotives you have. So if you want to let us know what locomotives you have, Dennis, you know, we'll give you a bit of advice based on that. And also what scale you are as well, because only certain point types are available in certain scales. That's so, it, Pico's Unifrog range is starting to come on now, isn't it? it but is. it's only it available is. for certain uh, pieces at the moment, but it hopefully will be something that continues to grow because it is great, the Unifrog is. stuff, isn't it? it? Is. Right. It gives you the best of both. That's it. <laughs> um, Ono Mulder, he says, I use the DR5000 controller from DigiKeys. Do you know this system? I've not heard I've of that one. I've heard of it. I've never seen one. No. I mean, there are so many different types of controllers out there. We barely covered both, it here, In both analog so? and digital. We stock a wide variety of these, but we don't stock every single type of unit out there. So there's quite a few that we've heard the names of, but we haven't got in front of us today. So, but again, they're all quite good systems, really. Each system has its own merits, really own different ways of styles. And that's a great topic to cover, actually, is why should I go for one of these over one of those? What's the advantage of that over that, for example? And a lot of it really is down to two things. One of it is down to ergonomics, i.e. how it feels in your hands, where it's located on your layout, how it physically operates. Yeah. The second there is what it can do for you as well, which we touched on before with the, um, with the dual controls on the HM2000, the single controller on the Combi, the digital controller such as the Select. They're all capable of very slightly different things, different amounts of power, different control system. But once you get up to digital as well, um, the different levels of controllers there, it's cases of some controllers can handle more locomotives at once, can't yes. they? And yes. some can handle more functions for lighting and sounds and things Absolutely. like that, can't they? So with, with digital, you'll always have a certain amount of amps going into your layout, and that is the amount of power that's going through those two wires into your track. 
And with all your track being live at once, you can have as many locomotives as you can fit on there, but they'll all take away a little bit of that power and slowly but surely the power you have available will drop and drop and drop. Yeah. So some of the controls we sell have a huge amount of power to start off with. You'll get up to five amps and that can operate a heck of a lot of, lot of locomotives oh, yeah. at once. But some of the smaller controllers won't quite get that far, but you'll still be able to operate four or five locos at the same time. One thing you can buy there for digital users as well is what's called a booster unit, and that will just be a big power system that puts further power into your layout. Yeah. It doubles or trebles the amount of power you've got in there to draw from. So if you do want to operate even more locomotives, you can buy a booster unit and increase just how much you want. But on analog, as said, we're thinking of more using it as a single track, single locomotive controller or a dual track, dual locomotive controller, you've no concerns regarding the power on yeah. that side. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what we keep saying, isn't it? Where it purely comes down to your own personal preference yes. and what sort of thing you want to do with the controller. Now, you might have an idea in mind, but if you're not sure, do get in touch with us. Uh, you can get in touch with our help desk team. You can get in touch with us through Facebook, through YouTube comments, any way you, you prefer, really. And we can always offer advice on what might be best for you. If you just give us a bit of information about, like you say, what gauge you're modeling, how much you want to be running, if you, you know, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors out there. There certainly is. And as, as Jack said before, we've, we've done a simple introductory video to digital and analog operation, which is available on our channel now. And we're also doing a live stream today. But we know it is quite a big topic, really. We could sit here for days, maybe weeks, discussing the merits of analog and digital and the bonuses and the ideal controller for every different situation. It's a huge topic to cover and we are looking at making more things like this on it. So if there are things you do want to see in there, you know, let us know the ideas. As much as we take them on board for making new products, we also take them on board for making new videos as well. So if, if there's some questions that are really tricky and you just need a little bit more guidance on them, either ask us right here, right now in the live stream or send us a comment afterwards and we'll have a look into it. Yeah, there's definitely, we've barely scratched the surface so far. So there's a lot more content in the future, I think. Um, Right, Evanswood Central says, hi everyone. Hi. I always prefer, will always prefer and therefore stay with analog. That's totally fair enough. If you're comfortable with using analog and that's what makes most sense for your layout, absolutely go for it. There isn't, I, I feel like sometimes there's potentially a stigma associated with using analog where some people think, oh, yeah. you've got to use digital because that's what it seems to be the best uh, option. It's just a different system. There, are, there are no rules. It's whatever it. you find the most comf comfortable system for you. Um, Jackamus Prime 50 says, hi, sorry I'm late. No worries glad, at all. Glad to have you here. Feel, feel free to rewind the live stream as well and you can see everything we've talked about so far. And don't forget, we have done another full video on uh, the differences between digital and analog control on our channel. So if you yes. click down there, you can check that out right now. Um, DB says, is it worth trying to convert older locomotives to DCC? Old as in 20 plus years old. Now, it depends how far back you go. Some of the locomotives from the sort of 70s and 80s are quite easy to convert yeah. over to digital. Whilst you won't have a digital ready socket as is in our class 66 here. We've got that showing for you there, the eight pin socket. Now that will have a straight socket. Older locomotives will just have the set of wires usually from one end to the other. And that's what's called a hard wire. That's where you have to solder in the decoder yourself. And with that, you can buy decoders that have the wires ready to be soldered into. And I will just get that out for you now. So this particular decoder here is one of our eight pin decoders. And you will see just there that it's got a series of wires coming out the bottom to the socket. You can snip those off and then solder the wires into the locomotive. And then that will be a fitted item. Now, that will work for a lot of older locomotives right back until sort of 1970s, 1980s produced models. If you go back a little further, say towards Hornby Dublo and Wren locomotives from the 1950s and 60s, they use a lot more power. They have a higher power draw through the motor. Yeah. So some of the decoders can't quite handle it. And there are some locomotives from that sort of era where you just can't. 
fit them isn't it's it's a bit it, tricky it? as to how to set up as well in the actual sort of electrical connections because some there. motors can't handle it as well can't they so that's it and how the chassis are set up some of them will have chassis that elect have electricity running through them so again one thing to say there is if you do have a list available of which ones you um which locomotives you want to look at fitting send us in a list and we can recommend which decoders go for what you might have to do to put it in there and that counts for everyone who's got dcc ready locomotives as well if you're not quite sure which decoder to use let us know have a look on our listing send us a comment or an email and we can advise exactly which locomotive and decoder you'll need and sort of how tricky a job it is as well but most of them aren't and if you're not quite feeling up to the fitting yourself, as said before, we do offer a fitting service as well, so you can send your locomotives to us and they'll come back with a shiny new decoder and them ready for you to start on a new digital layer. That's it. I suppose coming back to the question as well, you sort of said um, whether whether it's, it's worth trying to convert it. Now, we've sort of spoken about whether it's possible or not to do it. So if it is possible for your locos to be DCC fitted, it's down to you at the end of the day as to whether it's worth doing it if you really like that locomotive and you want to get it running on digital go for it absolutely that's that's absolutely. where it comes down to at the end of the day it's all your personal preference so um you don't necessarily if it can be digital fitted you don't necessarily have to go out there and get a brand new version of that loco you could use your existing one with a di uh, digital chip certainly. right um castle junction says there's a lot of controllers there and that the a4 <laughs> is one of his favorites uh, certainly is one of mine um, Evanswood Central says again, what's your favorite classic diesel loco? His is the Class 55 Delta. That is a classic one right there. Oh, th this is the answer from yesterday, isn't it? I, I can't think it is. You can't have give to give the same one. Two different days. It's the Class 37 for me. Yeah. I think it's going to be the yeah, same for me as well. Same. Well, big 37 fans me. <laughs> um, right. Collins Engage says, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Colin. Um, Got quite a lot of people saying hello. Hi guys, Red Shed, Mr. Dave6475, hello. I'm glad to have you here, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, Piccadilly Model Railway by John Warner. He says, I would highly recommend Z21. You can use it on your phone or iPad. Stunning. Yes, now that is something we haven't covered so far, and I was waiting for someone to bring it up. Thanks for bringing one, it up, John. One of the areas you can go into in digital is control through a computer or control through a smartphone. Example. There's quite a few options for doing quite that, a few isn't options. there? Because even Hornby offers an. Uh, is, it's called the e-link isn't it yes. for Hornby but I've I've tried a Z21 and they are a good bit of kit for just that as well using it on your smartphone and that will work through a wireless connection so you can actually use your phone as a separate controller and have a little controller in your hand which will fully drive the locos and that's great for larger systems or maybe those of you with outdoor model railways so you don't have to worry about having wires places where you want to have place. a wander around as well if, if you do want to head up and down and have a bit of a wander having a wireless system like that in place is a really good system i suppose in have. a way it can also almost be a bit of a safer system as well a yeah. wireless system because if you do have a larger layout and something happens at one end there's a derailment or a crash or something like that you're there and you can immediately press stop you don't yes. have to leg it over the other side of the loft or the other side of the Absolutely. garden and it stop on the controller do you so and that is one good thing about both <coughs> systems is they do come with an emergency stop function in yeah. both styles now analog it is just a case of shutting off power to the controller because you are cutting out that electricity the locomotive has no further power it will stop and on digital they quite often have a nice big red stop button like on the hallby select here and i believe on the nce that does have a nice big, big red big button red as button well there. i mean who doesn't resist pressing the big red button and that will do exactly the same thing in cutting all the power to your layout so when it me when it says emergency stop it, it means, means it. emergency yeah. stop. it will cut out the power it will just stop nothing will respond because there's no power going into the motor it's stop right straight, straight stop we're coming up to the 10 minute left mark. So we've already been speaking for 35 minutes. Wow. wow. <laughs> so um, we've had a lot of great questions already, but please do get your questions in now. We've got 10 minutes left if you want to ask anything else. But do remember that if there is anything we've not covered today or if there is something you want to know and you can't quite get it answered here, we are, you know, our team is always available on live, chat on the website, email, Facebook, and all, all, all those options. So do get in touch and they can help you out. Um, right. Mr. Dave6475, say no as you. He yeah. says, does the new Bachman dynamic system suffer from signal loss from fluorescent lighting? 
That's very Not specific. Not as far as we're aware. Now, that is one of the wireless systems that we touched on just then. And it has a wireless handset that reports into a main, what they call a base station. And as touched on, it is a wireless system with an infrared connection. We've not been made aware of any issues with with that sort of thing. Sometimes if you go quite a bit further away than you should do from the base station, it might start having signal issues, but we're talking quite a distance there. So oh, I bet, ma yeah. mainly over the size of like a normal loft, so to speak, or 20, 30 feet. But we've not heard many things about uh, having issues with fluorescent lights, etc. So you should be absolutely fine with using one of them with the system that it, that it comes with. Yeah, it's not something I've really come across before. Um, Right, Marius, I think we've answered this one before, but oh. we'll, we'll say it again. Different question. What's your favourite LMS tender engine? <laughs> oh, I, I think we went for the... I think... Well, I can't say we went for, because it is my favourite. It's the Coronation, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I think we both had to agree on that one, didn't we? It's such it a is. classic. It's, it's the biggest they got. It's the biggest and the best LMS locomotive. That's that's the one for Absolutely me. cracking thing. Uh, Andrew Keeley says Kato has, Kato has just come out with a DC controller that works off your phone's Bluetooth and it's an excellent option. I believe I, I've so. I've heard about that, yeah. It's something, we've we've actually just had the information about that from our supplier, so we will be stocking that pretty soon. So that is a wireless controller, as you say, through your phone for analog users, which brings that really great capability in there as well. And the other thing that Kato do do is they do a controller as well, which is actually like a throttle handle on a locomotive. Yeah, I so, love that controller. So it's something a little bit different because a lot of these controllers are dial-based, controlling how many how much electricity, sorry, is going into there? It feels the, a bit more the like speed a speed of your locomotive going through. A classic locomotive sort of crank handle, it does, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> and we've got those available at the lo at the moment. So if anyone wants to feel like they're really driving a locomotive, that's the that's the control. There is to a, go for. that's a, a nice point about these controllers is that there is quite a lot of different designs out there. So if it is coming down to more a stylistic choice yes. for you there is a lot out there like dave says if you want to feel like you're really driving a locomotive you can do that if you want something that looks quite sleek and modern with a nice dial on it you can do that if you want a big chunky absolute like power station unit yes. you can do that as well but i suppose coming back to the original question uh, original point about the kato uh, bluetooth control we're using our phones for controlling absolutely everything now you can control your tv from your phone all that so it it makes sense that you should that's, be able to control your model railway too certainly yeah that's the way it's going isn't and it and as said really it can come down even to the preference of whether you want to operate a unit like this in your hand or whether you want to have a big base station screwed down to your board that you stand in front of or there's even no if you right have a computer wrong. set up next to it. Absolutely, there's no right or wrong here. There's so much of this that comes down to just what you prefer. So, as Jack said before, there might be some stigma on some sides of it, but it really does just come down to what you like the most. That's it. Right, so, Jacobus Prime 50 says, uh, I have a question, is there any more brand new Hornby model accessories in the near future? So this new Hawk controller, which is available right now for just £14.50, this has just come out. Um, I believe this has got a couple of upgrades over the original one, hasn't it? Has, it? So it's a bit yeah. bigger, a bit more weight to it. Um, it still has that mechanism for locking it so you don't inadvertently shift to a different direction while your uh, train is running. And they've added that high-low function on the back, haven't they? I think that was a new feature. Yeah, that controls, again, the amount of power going into your layout, so you can control a little bit less control of how you do it, but still the top speed, etc. of locomotives coming through. But in terms but, of other stuff coming through, there's... There's a couple of bits and pieces coming through, but this is the main new accessory from Hornby this year. As I said, a reinvention of the standard analog controller. Really easy to use. As I said, to change direction, it's just a flick of the switch there and then turn the dial to make the locomotive go and stop. So that's the main accessory. They are bringing a few more different things into the range as well, such as signals, but this is the main one for this year. And there are, a f or it, Hornby does already have, if you're looking for digital stuff, there already is quite a lot out there from Hornby. Obviously we've got the Select on show here. There is their Elite controller available as well. The E-Link system is available in some cases and in train set That's form as well. That's the computer system. The computer it, system. It the computer. Um, and home, if you're after other accessories, Hornby does offer a wide range of decoders and TTS chips, which we touched on a bit earlier, which is your um, pre-put together sound chips for your locomotives. And they've even produced uh, recently a 
event van wagon, which is complete with DCC sound inside, which has loads of different uh, audio samples that you can play for station sounds, farm scenes, depots, whatever you want, really. And you can just chuck that somewhere in your layout and it'll play all the sounds. But I believe they've got another one of those coming out, haven't I they? I believe so later in the year. And this topic brings me back to one of the really big questions we get asked a lot. And also we got this on a few of our channels previously before the video is, Will all the different brands work with each other? Will a Hatton's decoder work in a Dapol locomotive? Will a Hornby controller work with a Backman piece of track? Generally, yes. It's all compatible. The digital system is broadly the same system in how it works. So it all talks to each other in all the way through. There are a set of basic standards out there, there, are, there to there make are. everything reasonably plug and play. And the same with analog as well. You'll find that you can plug in a Gage Master Combi controller into a Backman piece of track. A Dapol locomotive will work on a Hornby controller. You don't have to worry so much about the brand. It will all tie in together and all work well together. So. If you have a certain locomotive from a certain manufacturer and a controller from another, you're 99.9% .9 sure to be absolutely fine. But again, if you're not too sure, just drop us a message, send us an email or give us a call with what you want to see if it works together and we'll answer the question for you. Um, Evanswood Central says that he's looking to replace his current analog controller and would we recommend any of the Gage Master range? So we do stock quite a lot of the Gage Master controllers. Obviously we've got the, the nice simple, comp, simple combi uh, controller right here and we do actually use gauge master controllers on our test track as well for analog operation so we use the d don't we on our yeah, the on our d tracks. is essentially a dual track controller so a bit like a hm2000 the hm2000 where you can control two different tracks at once but the gauge master controllers go even further than that you can get three track and four track controllers all in one unit as well there really and is a lot of options in that range and the nice thing about the gauge master controllers is they are really robust bits of kit yes the ones quite a lot of them are fully metal construction they're very heavy so you don't have to worry about them being inadvertently pulled off a table or janked about they really are tough bits of kit and they can Absolutely. they can take a bit of punishment can't they like quite often we've seen in the past you know people in in sheds or using them outside and That's stuff like it. that and they, they get quite worn you know worn in but they, they really can but take a bit of punishment across the board really we sell a few different analog controllers from a few different suppliers and they are all reliable strong pieces of kit which do exactly as we've explained previously which is the point of getting the power into your layout to make the locomotives move so whichever way you go it's a really good one to look at and certainly the gauge master range is great to see but do have a look at the others and as we've said, I sound a little bit like a broken record here, I suppose, but it really is down to what takes your fancy, what your preference is, and whether the technical specifications are right for you regarding the amount of power, how you hold it, the whole lot. So definitely take a look at the Gauge Master, but also take a look at the whole range we sell and you may see something else that catches your eye. And if you're comparing a couple of them or you're just not quite sure which one you really are after, again, do get in touch with our team and they can give you even more advice about it, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Common Road Junction says, Hello. obviously we've got the, the Hornby 66 there, haven't we? Yes. He says, um, can you fit lights to the Hornby 66? You can. It's now a bit you, of work though. It is a little bit of work, but you can do that. You can either do that on analog or digital. It does need a soldering iron again, and you would need some of the smaller red and white and yellow LEDs to do that, to get the different lights on there. You would so need to drill out the... It, front uh, fascias. You would need to do that, like the front fascias, but certainly it's possible. You could even put cab lights in there if you wanted to. You could put a small engine room light in there if you so decided, but certainly you can, you can add lights onto that one should you wish. Fair enough. Right, there's a couple of extra questions after, there, but unfortunately we are coming right up to the end of our stream today. We've done 45 minutes there. So just want to say thank you very much to thank everyone you. for joining us. Um, I hope this has been useful for you guys to get a few of these big questions answered. We've covered a fair bit here, but obviously as mentioned, we have done a full video on the differences between digital and analog. If you click our channel down there, you can check that out. It was posted just a couple of hours ago, so you can watch that in full after we've finished up here. Yes. And again, thank you all for coming with us on today's live stream. We really appreciated all your questions. As usual, we've had some really good ones from you. And we've got a couple more to finish off with. Absolutely. So let's take a look. Bye. So the last couple of questions, um, we've just got Marius saying, what's your favorite SR tender engine? Oh, 
I really liked the Lord Nelson from the first live stream we did. Oh, it. yeah. I really liked the Lord Nelson. A bit of prestige there with the naval names on it and a really nice locomotive that's just come out as well. So a really nice bit of kit. Yeah, it's a bit unusual, that one. And he also asked, uh, SL, sorry, SLD51 asked, what's the favourite Bobo? I'm going to have to say 68 again, aren't I? Ooh. Well, you said the 68. <laughs> I'm going to go for the 20. Nice choice. 20, so oh, I, big I'll 20 go fan. really early diesel and you can go really modern diesel. So we get two different sides there. Right. I think we'll have to call it a day there, guys, anyway. So thanks very much for watching Thank anyway. You. Um, remember to hit like if you like this this live stream anyway. Uh, check out the other video we posted earlier today. Hit subscribe to see more videos and live streams in the future. And make sure to head to our Facebook page as well to like that for all the latest Model Railway news. But anyway, I've been Jack. He's been Dave. I have. And uh, we will see you guys in the next stream. See you soon. Take see you care. later.